So, you've just smelted your first titanium ingot and have started to dive into AE2. Or, maybe you're a veteran who just wants to learn a little more about this all-powerful logistics mod. Today, we are going to go over the fundamental basics of networking within the context of GTNH, with the goal to equip you with the tools and knowledge you will need to start your long AE2 journey. While there are plenty of AE2 tutorials, GTNH specifically has very unique interactions with its components, and even has some of its own features that cannot be found in any other mod pack. These features make traditional AE2 guides harder to translate, in my opinion. Additionally, GTNH is pretty much impossible to complete without the proper use of AE2, which is why I hope this guide can help you on your journey. Let's get started. Matter Energy or ME networks are hands down the most powerful form of digital storage in all of modern Minecraft. They can store items, fluids, magical superfluids, and even physical space. But that's only half the magic though, and with the proper setup, ME systems can automatically craft anything at the click of a button, move power and items across dimensions, and even interact with the world around you. An ME network does this through blocks called components. The list of components is long, including terminals, drives, interfaces, storage buses, export buses, P2P, and many, many more things. But today we're going to stick to the most used ones. The first components you will add to your network are a storage drive and a terminal. Drives contain up to 10 storage cells, which come in different variations to store items, fluids, and other weirder things digitally. Your first investment will be in item cells, which come in tiers, starting with 1k cells, 4k, 16k, and beyond, each with more digital capacity for items. While different item storage cells can have more or less total storage, the most basic of them can only store 63 different types of items, which incentivizes you to build many smaller storage cells to host a wide variety of different item types. Keep in mind that 8 bytes is equal to a stack, meaning that a 1k cell can hold approximately 8192 items. Your storage drives pair directly with our second component, ME terminals, which you can add to your network to access the contents of cells and deposit items within them. The basic terminal has variations, such as the crafting terminal, which has a built-in crafting table that can pull items from your entire network. Another important terminal, and possibly the most powerful one, is the patterning terminal, which we will get to later. The next component on our list is the energy acceptor, which takes GTEU and turns it into energy for your ME network. Moving items and hosting components on a network costs energy, which the energy acceptor can provide. Although components have a small amount of energy storage, you should pair these with energy cells and their upgraded version, the dense energy cell, anywhere on a network, in order to create a power buffer for more intensive use of the system. When you want to use more than 8 components together, you must use an ME controller. These are the heart of your ME system and are arguably the most important block of all. ME controllers are responsible for supplying channels to a network. Each face of a controller can transmit 32 channels, which allow for up to 32 components to be connected to it. ME controllers are modular structures and can be built in many ways, but they have three specific rules. 1. All ME controller blocks on an ME network must be connected, meaning that you can only have one controller per network. Two. The size of the ME controller must be within a 7x7x7 7 by 7 by 7 cube. 3. An ME controller can have two adjacent blocks and at most one axis at a time. These are important, but let's return to these with a little more context, shall we? Interfaces are the bread and butter of your network, and they are most known for being able to push patterns to machines for auto-crafting. They come in two variations. Full block interfaces, which output from all sides, and part interfaces, which only take up one face of a block and can share cable space. Any items pushed into interfaces are stored within a connected network. You can also stock items within interfaces to be pulled out by GT conveyors, Ender IO conduits, and blocks with similar pulling power. Interfaces can also act as a messenger for networks, exposing their contents to storage buses. Storage buses are the bomb. A storage bus allows your network to see and pull items from an attached inventory. It is important to know that storage buses will never push or pull items in or out of your network. Instead, items which are pushed into or pulled from storage buses move instantly, making them a heavyweight for automation. 
They are most commonly attached to external storage, such as drawers or chests, to make the items within them visible on a network through your terminal, but not stored within its cells. A storage bus on one ME network facing an interface that is attached to another ME network will be able to view the entirety of the second network's contents, allowing you to chain networks together. This concept is called subnetworking, and I will cover it more thoroughly in another video. Just know that a subnet is as simple as a storage bus viewing items or fluids through an interface. Export buses will take stored items and push them into an external inventory. Import buses will pull items into a network that has available storage. Generally, these get no play for me, and I prefer to either stock interfaces and use GT conveyors to pull items or push items into interfaces using GT's built-in pushing power from output buses. Contrary to this, fluid export buses can be handy early on to stock fluids in hatches. Finally, peer-to-peer, -peer, or P2P, is a powerful and complicated tool that has many different types, ranging from MEP2P, Redstone P2P, EUP2P, and much more. You can assign the type of P2P by clicking its face with a relevant item. For example, any GregTech cable can turn a P2P into an EUP2P, and any Redstone for Redstone. P2P is essentially a portal that connects one side to the other, as long as both are connected to the same network. I know for a fact that you'll want to know more about this, so stay tuned while we cover our bases. In order to attach a component to a network, you need to connect it to your controller. For this, we use cables. There are two variations of cables that can carry channels. Glass cable and covered cable can carry 8 channels each and support part components that take up less space than a block, such as storage buses, export buses, and P2P. Dense cables cannot connect to part components, but can carry 32 channels each. Cables that are different colors will never connect to each other, but will connect to basic uncolored fluix, covered, or dense cables. This can help you distribute channels more precisely. Related to cables are quartz fibers and cable anchors, which can be mounted to any side of a cable. Cable anchors will separate two cables between them, even if both cables are the same color. Quartz fibers are another important part of subnetworking, and can be used to transfer power between networks without transmitting channels or any other data. As far as rules go, this is pretty much it. Anything you can imagine, you can probably do, with few exceptions, which we will get to. In order to start this all off, you will need to build a controller. ME controllers are modular, and you can build one that supports over 21,000 channels, which is incredibly overkill. Most Stargators will use around 2 to 3,000 channels to complete the pack. 3,000 channels? Nine. Do the math, that's almost a hundred different dense cables. How the heck am I gonna organize that and move it around my base? Well, dear viewer, remember those portals called P2P? Together, we are gonna use those portals to conquer the world. In the beginning of your AE2 journey, you will want to outline a seven by seven by seven cubic area in which you will place your main net controller. Note that each ME controller block you place will cost energy to run, so you don't have to start with a full controller. Underneath this, you will want to outline a small area where you will place something called a P2P Manager Subnet. We're going to call this guy, I don't know, 8? Eight. 8's job is to hold up an ME P2P portal to an open face on your mainnet controller and connect it to another ME P2P anywhere throughout your base, bringing 32 channels from each face of the controller anywhere, using only 2 channels on 8 subnet. This means that each dense cable coming out of 8 subnet can carry 32 times 32 channels, or a whopping 1024 channels. On the receiving side of the P2P, you can take out a dense cable and get up to 32 mainnet channels to do with what you please. Again, imagine as if the P2P is a portal directly from the face of your controller to your dense cable. You can bind two ME P2Ps with a memory card shift right-clicking the input side and then right-clicking the output side to bind them together. Later, you can also use an advanced memory card to bind P2Ps on a network without having to physically travel back to your controller. My network looks like this, with P2P on each face of my 7x7x7 controller and my P2P manager subnet taking these P2P connections and distributing them throughout my base. While there are more dense mainnet controller designs that can carry more channels, my controller is accessible and simple, and will be more than enough to finish the pack comfortably.
There are a couple tools that you can use to make your AU2 journey a lot smoother. The first and most enlightening of which is called the Network Visualization Tool. Right click on any part of a network to see a projection of its channels, P2P connections, and much more. This tool will also highlight components without channels in red, making it the first debugging tool I grab. The memory card is a multi-purpose card mostly used to bind different types of P2P connections. Shift right click to copy a frequency and then right click to paste that frequency. The memory card also comes with an advanced variant that allows you to pull up a GUI of all similar P2P connections on a network when binding, allowing you to make connections cross dimensions or without walking if you're lazy like me. The wireless setup kit in combination with wireless connectors allows you to make connections through walls or at long distances at a steep quadratic energy cost the further the connection. Wireless connectors are one-to-one -one and bring 32 channels which you can use most effectively early on to get AE2 auto crafting into your clean room. Simply click one connector and then click on the other with the wireless setup kit to establish a connection. The network tool allows you to get data on a network. Use right click on any network component to see a GUI of attached parts and individual power usage, storage capacity, and more. You can also shift right click any component or cable with the network tool or any GT wrench to break it. Finally, the quartz knife is the unsung hero of AE2 organization as it allows you to rename any component, most notably interfaces and crafting computers. Now that you have some context, let's get to the most powerful part of AE2, auto crafting. Auto crafting involves programming patterns, a packet of information that tells the AE2 system what to send, where, and what to expect back. Patterns are programmed in one of many pattern terminals and placed in interfaces connected to your network. Once you place a pattern in an interface, it will show up as a possible craft in any ME terminal. You can middle click on the item you want within your terminal to start a craft. AE2 auto crafting is incomprehensibly powerful because of two simple rules. Rule one, when calling a craft, it will send the required items through the interface holding the pattern to any inventory, and the craft will complete whenever any interface on the network gets the expected items back. The beauty of this is that patterns can be abstract. All hot ingots will always go to my vacuum freezer, and as such, I edit my EBF patterns to return a cooled ingot upon providing my EBF dust. This layer of abstraction can be used for precise control over your autocrafting systems. Rule 2. When calling a craft, if there is an item missing that has a pattern, the ME system will automatically call for that item to be crafted, attaching it to your current craft, chaining infinitely down to the most basic components. This chaining pattern behavior is the reason that a pack like GTNH is even possible and it allows you to move millions, even billions of items at the click of a button in order to finish a single craft. Crafting capacity isn't just infinite though, I, yet, uh, and requires that you use crafting computers to host the items. When a craft is called, items are pulled into the crafting computer requiring internal storage. These crafting computers come in different variations, 1K, 4K, 16K, and so on, mirroring cells. You can attach multiple crafting computer blocks to one single CPU in order to increase its size as long as the shape remains a rectangular prism. Additionally, you will want to add crafting coprocessors which add parallelization to your computers, allowing them to send multiple recipe steps at once. Early AE2 requires that you briefly set up auto crafting with an array of single block machines, which has some downsides. The first is that circuits cannot sanely be interacted with within GT single blocks, so you will need to make a single block for each circuit that you want. Also, fluids cannot be sent by AE2 until late EV, which means you will need to stock fluids and machines some other way. In order to set up a single block machine with auto crafting, I recommend a part interface directly on top of a machine. Set this machine to auto output and use a wrench to make sure the machine outputs upwards back into the interface. You can allow recipe items to be inserted from the output side by right clicking the machine with a screwdriver. Finally, place your pattern in the interface and call it. The other important auto crafting block is the molecular assembler, which is AE2's auto crafting table. Simply place an interface next to a molecular assembler and put your patterns in it and it should work like a charm. Auto crafting really saves you a lot of time running around and organizing batch crafts and begins to open up my favorite part of the game. 
Before we go, I want to introduce you quickly to some cards which can be placed inside components in their upper right hand slots of their GUI in order to modify their functionality. The acceleration card will likely be your first investment which speeds up a wide array of different components such as export buses or molecular assemblers. The redstone card allows you to toggle a component on and off with relevant redstone. The inverter card is essentially a blacklist card. When placed in a storage bus, items filtered will not be able to enter the inventory, while all other items will. The fuzzy card allows items with any metadata to pass. For example, a storage bus with a fuzzy card filtered with an iron chestplate will take any chestplate of any damage variation. Sticky cards are incredibly valuable and make it so filtered items can only be deposited in a specific storage location, such as a partitioned cell or a storage bus. If the storage bus is out of storage, sticky carded items will simply not be able to enter the network at all, which can lead to some interesting organizational hierarchies. Capacity cards simply increase the filter size on applied components such as storage buses. Pattern capacity cards are used for interfaces to increase the amount of patterns a single interface can fit, up to 36 with three pattern capacity cards. Or dictionary cards are very powerful and allow for inventories to be filtered by a series of expressions. While this is mainly helpful for ore processing, it does have other applications, such as automatically filtering hot ingots into your vacuum freezer. Okay, that is a lot of information, and while the knowledge here is great to get started, there is far more to discover, which I will be including in another video, so su subscribe so you can catch it. If there is anything AE2 related in GTNH that you would like me to cover, please make sure to comment below and I'll try to get it into the next video. I hope that this guide was helpful, and if it was, you can support me by commenting, subscribing, joining my Discord, and following me on Twitch. As always, be kind to yourself and others, and peace.